μας που σας παρουσιάζω την κυρία Δέσποινα Σχεντέρη για να μας αναμασάμε τα δικά μας θέματα μεταξύ μας και αυτό είναι το, ας το πω, ελάττωμά μας που δεν περνάμε αυτά που θέλουμε πέρα από μας. Λοιπόν, να σας χαιρετήσω και στα αγγλικά. Καλησπέρα σας. Seeing so many of you here, I'm truly humbled and very honored. And I thank each and every one of you for coming. I wish to thank individually Φώτης Γερασόπουλος, Dimitris Tasopoulos, Nikos Vatsikouras, Kostas Khatsistapanidis, who helped me with transportation around the area. A special thank you goes to Elias Nofikidis, founder and past president of the center here, who made this whole thing possible, and thank you, Elia. Now, over my many years here in the United States, I have come to understand that many people have little knowledge of the fullness of Hellenism that flourished in Asia Minor, or they're rather confused about the few things they know. And several young Greek Americans have told me that although they knew their great-grandparents were from there, meaning Asia Minor, they were reluctant to say so because, well, that's Turkey. And they did not want to be misunderstood as being of Turkish origin. I will mention one rather interesting incident that happened in the late 1990s. Uh, it was during the month of December when Andrew Rooney of 60 Minutes talked about who Santa Claus was and he said that Santa Claus was Saint Nicholas, a Turkish bishop. <laughs> Needless to say that I immediately protested electronically and urged friends to do the same. A, in Islam, there are no bishops, and B, the land St. Nicholas was born in in 270 AD was not Turkish at the time. Turks came to the area nine centuries later. Well, after two weeks, Mr. Rooney apologized for his error on the air, in a rather arrogant way, though, being upset with, as he said, Greek-American viewers who complained. Oddly enough, though, years later, on December 6, 2009, I came across an article written by the Catholic News Agency stating the same thing. Quote, on December 6, the faithful commemorate a Turkish bishop in the early church. End of quote. I have brought some copies of that article with me for anyone who would be interested to look at. Let me see here. I missed a page. Let's stuck together. I apologize for that. I have also brought copies of a review of Tanera Aksham's book, The Young Turk's Crime Against Humanity. And Tanera Aksham is the first scholar of Turkish origin to publicly acknowledge the genocide. Tonight, I will not narrate history. Rather, I will refer to historical events as I talk about the Asia Minor Greek heritage via names and stories from as far back as the antiquity. So let's start at the beginning. You see a map of Asia Minor with the names of region states in ancient times. <coughs> now, we all talk about Asia, Asia, Asia. Now, in Greek mythology, Asia, was a titan goddess in Lydia, you see that on the map. And the titans were a race of powerful deities, Theotides, descendants of Yi and Uranos, earth and sky. The titans were overthrown by a race of younger gods, the Olympians, during a Titanomachia, War of the Titans. When this area was conquered by the Romans, Lydia became a province of the Roman Empire with the name Asia. Now, the name Asia Minor was given to the area as we know it by the author Pablo Sorosius in the 4th century AD. We also hear the name Anatolia, 
when referring to this region. Constantinus Porfirogenitus, emperor of the Macedonian dynasty of the Byzantine Empire in the 9th century AD, referred to Asia Minor as Anatolikon Thema, Eastern Thema, from the Greek words Anatoli, meaning East, and Thema, administrative division, placing this region, Asia Minor, to the east of Byzantium, while Europe was lying to the west. Anatoly then became Anatolia, and the Turks call it Anadolu. You might come across an etymology Turks give to the word Anadolu. Anna in Turkish means mother, Dolu means full, and the word Anadolu is, is interpreted as mother's full embrace. That's what Anatolia means for the Turks. Several years ago, when I went to a party at a friend's house, the host introduced me to a lady from out of town saying, well, this is Mrs. So-and-so, and this is this Ms. Kinders. Within seconds, the lady said, are you from Asia Minor? Because the artist says, I was stunned. I thought, where did this come from? Yes, I told her, but how did you know we just met? Her response was, it's your name, Despina. It is a very common name among Greeks from Asia Minor, and almost all Despinas have roots in that part of the world. And yes, my father was born in Amisos, now known as Samson, or <coughs> Samsus, on the coast of the Black Sea in Pondos. He was not Pontius, though. His grandparents had moved there from Kesari of Cappadocia, and they were Karamanlides. Now, I will get back to the word Karamanlis. My mother was from Prusa, now known as Bursa. Now, how did the city get its name? It is Greek. In 202 BC, Philip V of Macedonia, having won a battle in the area where Prusa is, granted the city called Chios at the time to Prusias, the king of Bithynia, you can see the, the area on the map, for helping Philip in that battle. King Prusias then renamed the city after him as Prusa. And since I talked about And since we talk, I talked about my parents, here's a picture of my parents the day after their wedding with the bride wearing the so-called defteriatico forma, the second day dress, second day after the wedding. As about the Turkish name Samson for the ancient city of Amisos, now here is how it evolved. The statement, I'm going to Amisos, in Greek was, Pigeno is Amison, that became is Amison, is Samson, and then Samson. Similarly, the Turkish name Istanbul for the city of Constantinople, which was Ipoli, the city. I'm going to the city, Pigeno Istinpolin, became Istinpol, Istanbul, Istanbul. The city now known as Izmir, Smirni, is Smirnin, is Smirn, is Smir in Turkish. Now, what about the word Karamanlis, Karamanlides that I mentioned earlier? The dynasty of the Karamans emigrated to the area of Cappadocia from Azerbaijan during the 13th century. They expanded their territory, fought many wars with the Ottomans, and the Karamanid state was eventually eliminated by the Ottomans in 1487. The name of the Karamans, though, has remained to this day Karamanlı is a Persian from the Karaman area, meaning Cappadocia. The suffix ler in Turkish means from. Through centuries of Turkish occupation, we adopted that suffix and changed it to lis, because there is no sound l as like ler in Greek. So Karaman lis is someone from the area of Karaman, just like we call Rigas Vereos, Rigas Belestin lis, meaning he was from the town of Belestino, and Dramalis, remember him, the Battle of the Venite in 1822, who was born in Drama. Since Greece was surrounded by water, the sea has always played an important role in its history. The ancient Greeks were active seamen seeking opportunities for trade and founding new independent colonies at coastal sites across the Mediterranean Sea. Am I 
By the 7th and 6th centuries BC, Greek colonies and settlements stretched all the way from Western Asia Minor to Southern Italy, Sicily, and North Africa. So, 11th century BC, Greeks colonized the eastern coast of the Aegean Sea. 10th century BC, Greeks found Militos, not far from the island of Samos. Here's the map. You can see part of Samos on the top left. The city of Miletus was considered the greatest Greek metropolis and its people had founded more colonies than any other Greek city. Among them were Amisos, Sinope, Trapezus, and many more. Miletus' name today is, believe it or not, Milet, after deleting the last two letters from its ancient name. It just happens, though, that in Turkish, Milet means people, cosmos, laos, so it sounds Turkish. Thaisomilisios, the Greek philosopher who is considered the founder of Greek science, mathematics, geometry, and philosophy, was from Miletus, and according to Herodotus, Thais predicted the year of the May 28, 585 BC solar eclipse. Now, 700 BC, Greek colonization spreads to southern Italy. 657 BC, the city-state of Megara founds Byzantium. The immigration effectively ceased in the 6th century, by which time the Greek world had culturally and linguistically become much larger than the area of present-day Greece. Greek colonies were not politically controlled by their found, founding cities, but they did retain religious and commercial links with them. So, Greeks have been living in Asia Minor, in today's Turkey, for over 3,000 years. After the Ottoman Turks conquered the area, names of many cities were changed or semi-changed to sound Turkish. Some have not, though, like Amasya, like Marmara, Kutakya, Menemeni, and others. And some geographic areas still bear their Greek names since the ancient times. So let's start with the Black Sea. Strabon, who was born in 64 BC in Amasya, was a Greek historian, philosopher, and geographer. In his 17-volume Geographia, Strabon reports that the Black Sea was called Opondos, which actually means the sea. Later, it was called Epsinos Pontos, the hospitable sea. The word Epsinos, F meaning good, and Xenos meaning stranger, replaced an earlier name, Axenos Pontos, inhospitable sea. Inhospitable sea is the first, first was found in Pindar's writings, and Pindar's was a Greek lyric poet from Thiva during the 5th century BC. Strabon thinks that the Black Sea was called inhospitable before the Greek colonization because it was difficult to navigate and because its shores were inhabited by savage tribes. The name was changed to hospitable after Greeks from Miletus colonized the southern shoreline, the area we now call Pondos. As to the origin of the name Black Sea, that many probably wonder why black, there are several theories. One theory is that the, the Black Sea is the world's largest meromictic basin where the deep waters do not mix with the upper layers of water that receive oxygen from the atmosphere and that makes the water appear black. Meromictic means meromictiki, partially mixed, and holomictic Holomictiki means totally mixed. Another theory is the intense fog that develops over the Black Sea absorbs light, making the water appear black. And the last theory for the name Black Sea is the fact that it was the sea of death. Sailors of long ago, if caught in a storm, usually died because of, of the absence of islands, thus no harbors, as well as the ferocity of the storms.
Now, earlier, I mentioned the name, the name Pondos. As you see on the map, it's the strip of land on the southern coast of the Black Sea. The region was first spoken of as the country of the Pondos in the expedition of Cyrus by Xenophon. Here were analysis to Xenophontos. The analysis, though, later was used by Alexander the Great as a field guide. Now, on our way to the Aegean Sea, we first go through the Bosporus Strait, Tastenatu Bosporu. The word means the passage of a cow. Vus means Ayelada, cow, and Boros means Pedasma, passage. Now, the story behind it, a princess in the city of Argos named Io had an affair with Zeus, what's new? <laughs> Zeus's wife, Ira, found out about it and became furious. Io into a cow to protect her from his wife. At the time, the cow was around Mykines in Peloponnesus and then went to Evia. This is how Evia got its name. F meaning good and Bus meaning cow. So Evia means the good cow or the place with a lot of cows. <laughs> Zeus's wife, Ida, still wanting revenge, sent a horse fly to torment Io, and the cow kept moving from place to place, and she finally went to the Exynos Pondos, the Black Sea, passing through the strait that we call Bosporus, the passing of the cow. Today, Io, if you look it up, is known as the moon of the planet Jupiter, Zeus, Zeps in Greek mythology. We then enter Propondis, the Propondida, also called the Sea of Marmara. Pro means before, and Pondus means sea. So Propondis means before reaching the sea, the Pondos, the Exynos Pondos. The Sea of Marmara takes its name from the Marmara Islands, rich in marble. Continuing our journey, we now enter the Hellespont, or the Dardanelle Strait. Now, Elispontos means, Pontos means sea, as we said, and of Eli. Phrixus and Eli were son and daughter of King Athanas in Orcomenos, in Biotia, which is in central Greece, and their jealous stepmother conspired to have them killed by having them sacrificed to the gods for the famine that had hit the kingdom. However, the famine was caused by the stepmother herself. She had all the kingdom seeds roasted so that they wouldn't sprout. Then their real mother, cloud goddess Nefeli, Nefos meaning cloud, sent a wing ram whose fleece was of gold, remember that, Criari metopisopaloderes, to their rescue. The ram took them on its back and flew from Greece all the way to Colchis in today's Georgia by the Black Sea. On the way there, Eli fell into the sea, and the sea was named after her, Elis Pondos. As to the name Dardanella, it is derived from the name of the ancient city of Dardanos, later called Dardanella, on the ancient shore of Elis Pondos, built by Dardanos, son of Zeus and Electra, who was a, a mountain nymph on the island of Samothraki. Now, Dardanos had left his home in Peloponnesus after the big flood, that of the Phkalion, equivalent to the biblical flood, when the top of mountains had become islands. There are several operas based on the story of Dardanos. The first one, that of Jean-Philippe Jean Rameau, was performed in the Music Academy of Paris in 1739. By the way, one of Dardanos' sons, Zakynthos was the first settler on an island in the Ionian Sea that was named after him. So much about the antiquity. The Byzantine Empire derived its name from the small town Byzantium. It was founded by the people of Megara and named for their leader, Visas. Later, the city of Byzantium was named Constantinopoli to honor Emperor Constantinos the Great St. Constantine in the Orthodox Church ruled the Roman Empire for 31 years. And the 
this is a coin showing business, and today is the Archaeological <coughs> Museum in Constantinople. Now, when the western half of the Roman Empire fell in 476 AD, its eastern half came to be known as the Byzantine Empire. It endured and flourished for 11 centuries. <coughs> the story of the Byzantine civilization is not often discussed in the West. It's something of a void within Western European history. It is the forgotten empire that rescued, though, Western civilization. For more than a millennium, Byzantium reigned and actually shielded Western Europe from invasion from the East, mainly the Arabs. When Europe fell into the Dark Ages of Macedonia, and literacy all but vanished in the West, Byzantium made primary education available to both sexes. There were hospitals, public baths, homes for the care of the elderly, and much more. Despite all wars as we know them, with tens of thousands of slain warriors, ruthless grasping of power, assassinations, and all kinds of scheming, Contrary to the commonly held belief, it was Byzantium that preserved great gifts of the classical world. Of the 55,000 ancient Greek texts in existence today, 40,000 were transmitted to us by Byzantine scribes as Lars Brownsworth writes in his book, Lost to the West, published in 2009. It's worth mentioning that 39 years after the fall of Constantinople, Christopher Columbus disco discovered America using a translated Byzantine text of the Geographia Ptolemaea. Now, Constantinople fell to Turks in 1453, and all we, we all know about it. Most of us talk about the 400 years of Turkish occupation. For some regions of Greece, though, it's more than that. Thessaloniki, for example, was conquered 11 years earlier than Constantinople and was liberated in 1912. So Thessaloniki was under the Turkish occupation for 480 years, not 400. Most of us know the story of the dance of Zalungo, Korostu Zalungo, when women of Suli, up in the mountains of Epirus, threw themselves and their children from Mount Zanlongo down into the gorge so that they wouldn't be captured by Turks. That was in 1803, 18 years before the Greek Revolution in 1821. Later, in 1822, the same thing happened in now Saint Macedonia, down onto the waterfalls into a gorge from a bridge over the river Arapitsa. This is a monument in Nausa reminding us of what happened back then. Now back to Asia Minor. In 1680, 141 years before the Greek Revolution, 30 girls threw themselves down into the Alis River from a 500 feet vertical rock, again, not to be captured by Turks. That happened in Pafra a town close to Omisos, and since then, that river is called in Turkish Gözkubirmak, and the, ri the river of the girls, and the ancient castle on the top of that rock is called Gözkulesi, the girls' castle. And this is the rock in Bakra. There is a beautiful poem written about the girl's castle by Christopher Sagritelis, a poet and friend of mine in Washington, West Metropolitan Area. And now, Smyrna. About the name of the city, there are several explanations. One of these involve a Greek myth derived from an Amazon named Smyrna. Smyrna is also an ancient Greek word for myrrh, or myra, or myron that in the Greek language it became a general term for something that smells good, like perfume. And now, one more explanation. The name of the city was originally Mira, 
later evolved to Smirna, the mother of Adonis in Greek mythology. Goddess Aphrodite, after a quarrel with Mira, got her revenge by making Mira fall in love with her own father, Kinnitas, king of Cyprus. Mira dressed like a slave of the palace, tricked her father, and spent the night with him. When her father found out her identity, he became furious, drew his sword, and pursued Mira. She fled, and she turned to the gods for help. They took pity on her and transformed her into a myrrh tree. While in plant form, Mira gave birth to Agonis. He jumped off the trunk of the tree. And according to legend, the aromatic exudings of the myrrh tree are Mira's tears. Now, at the beginning of the 20th century, the city of Smidni, as well as sections and neighborhoods in different towns and villages, were flourishing. Here are some photographs of the city of Smyrny taken at that time. This is the sporting club. The port of Smyrny, the <coughs> This is the central part of Smyrna at the beginning of the 20th century, it's a postcard. And then, and then the Asia Minor catastrophe, Mikrasiatiki catastrophe. So much has been written about that awful era. The American ambassador to Turkey at the time, Henry Morgenthau, wrote the book, The Murder of a Nation. The year's consul general, George Horton, and I would to the burning of Smyrny, wrote the book, The Blight of Asia. The National Geographic, in its November 1925 issue, published a long article by Melville Chatter, History's Greatest tra Tragedy Stalks Through the Near East. The publication also included many pictures taken by eyewitness photographers at the time. There are many reports of other eyewitnesses, like Stanley Hopkins of the Near East Relief, by Mr. Randall of the Foreign Office, and many more. There are also countless books and articles written by people who survived the massacre and by their children who either lived through the disaster or heard stories firsthand. One of them, Haris Tsitkinidis, wrote the book titled we finally uprooted them, Epitelus tus Ksevizosame, a reference to the words spoken by Kemal Ataturk on August 13, 1923. The Greeks who inhabited Asia Minor since the ancient times were Greeks by identity, by their roots, their language, their religion, their traditions, their civilization, regardless of the fact that they did not live within the borders of Greece or the fact that they were not Greek citizens. They were educated and were always proud of being Greek. They worked hard, they elevated their standard of living, and they were cosmopolitan. The Greek genocide, also known as the Pontic Genocide, was the systematic killing of the Greek population of the Ottoman Empire from 1914 to 1923. It included massacres, forced deportations involving death marches, expulsions, executions, and destruction of Christian Orthodox cultural, historical, and religious monuments and churches. The Armenians suffered a similar fate and during the same period, it is estimated that more than 2.7 million Greeks, Armenians, and Assyrians were outright slaughtered or were victims of the so-called white death of disease and starvation. Turkish nationalists, the young Turks as they were then called, gained control of the Ottoman government by revolting against Sultan Hamid in 1908. The process of the National Turkish Movement is attributed to Mustafa Kemal, later called Ataturk, as he was the primary spokesperson and public figure from very early on. 
the goal of the Turkish nationalists was to achieve the Turkification of the empire by eliminating ethnic Christian minorities such as Greeks, Assyrians, and Armenians. The expulsion started as early as 1908, and at first it was being executed here and there without a concrete plan. The official decision was made in October of 1911 in Thessaloniki at a secret meeting of the leaders of the Turkish nationalists. The Greek genocide started in January of 1913 under the orders of the three pashas that were ruling the, the um, Ottoman government. Ben Pasha, Talat Pasha, and Jamal Pasha. Shortly after the genocide of the Armenians and the Assyrians followed. First, the Christian men were rounded up and sent to labor battalions in the interior of Turkey, which were essentially battalions of death, or were forced into some ditch for execution. My father was in one of those groups as a 15-year-old boy. Out of more than 1,200 men and boys forced into a ditch after three months of being pushed into the interior of the country, less than 200 survived, and that only because they fell down before the bullets got to them. And this is a picture of Armenian Greek men arrested and sent to exile, 1922, in Smyrna. And after eliminating a significant part of the male population, the Turks proceeded to eliminate the rest of the Greek population, including the elderly, women, and children. Their plan was to deport the Greeks and Armenians to the interior and expose them to severe weather conditions, hunger, and illness. And so they did. And here are some pictures from those awful days not necessarily in chronological order. The first three were taken by the American Red Cross. As it says there. Here are Armenian civilians marched out of Karpet to a prison in Mezire by Turkish soldiers in April of 1915. This is one of the long lines that led them to death. Christians forced by Turks to march to the desert to die. Armenians walking to their death. Turkish hangmen and their victims, 1915. Now this one was photographed by a German officer in Turkey. <coughs> Massacre of Greeks and Armenians in Trapezus. Hang Pondian woman after her mutilation and decapitation. This is a picture in a 2009 publication of a Thelotopia, the Massacre of Pondians. No words are needed to describe this picture. Now the following are pictures taken during the burning of Smidney. And here it's the city after the fire. Smyrna wiped out was the headline in the New York Times. Now, the First World War was a real disaster for the Ottoman Empire, and the Allies at the time, France, Britain, and Russia, started demanding Ottoman territory. As they said, the empire was the sick men of Europe that had come to its own end. Sultan Mehmed VI 
in order to ensure the continuation of his rule, was willing to cooperate with the Allies. So Turkey signed the armistice of Mudros, Anakohitu Mudru, in October of 1918, marking the defeat of the Ottoman Empire. It was signed on the ship Agamemnon at the harbor of the island of Limnos. Kemal Ataturk was born in 1881 in Thessaloniki, which was still under the Ottoman rule, of course. His first name was Mustafa. His math teacher called him Kemal, which means perfection, because of his academic excellence later in life when it was required that all Turkish citizens took a last name which they didn't have, he was given the name Ataturk, father of the Turks, for his reforms and for creating the modern Turkish country. So his name became Mustafa Kemal Ataturk. From 1908, when the Young Turk Revolution started, and in the years that followed, Ataturk continued to be promoted in the military. He became increasingly angry with the concessions the Sultan kept making to the Allies. He went to the city of Amisos to organize the Turkish National Party, Nationalists Party, and he began to form an army against the Sultan. The day of his landing in Amisos, May 19, 1919, was so important to Ataturk that not knowing his, the exact date of his birth, he later used that date, May 19, as his birth date on his official documents. Meanwhile, Following Greece's participation on the Allied side, Greece sent 20,000 troops to Smyrna to take control of the city as planned by the Triple Entente, French, Britain, and Russia, for the partition of the Ottoman Empire. Greece was going to take certain pieces of land. It was May 15, 1919, four days before Ataturk's landing in Amisos. Legal justifications for the Greek army to land in Smyrna because a lot of people say, why did they, we have to land in Smyrna? Why did we have to go to Smyrna? That was the reason for the massacre. There were legal justifications for the Greek army to land in Smyrna, and it was found in the Article 7 of the Armistice of Budros. And that allowed the Allies, quote, to occupy any strategic points in the event of any situation arising which threatens the security of allies, end of quote. As soon as Ataturk found out about the Greek troops being in Smyrna, while he was in Amisos, he informed the Grand Vizier Farid Pasha with telegram stating that he would never accept the invasion of Izmir. So, the Greek-Turkish war started. The first phase of the war, May 1919 to October of 1920, encompasses the Greek landings in Asia Minor and their consolidation along the Aegean coast. Now here's a story that has not been written before. On June 22, 1919, about a month after the Turk landed in Amisos, he issued the Amasya Circular, now that has been published, declaring that the independence of Turkey was in danger. Now, Amasya is not far from Amisos. On Ataturk's way to Amasya, can write, but history would have taken a different turn. Greek guerrillas in the nearby mountains had found out both about Kemal Ataturk's plan uh, visit to Amasya and his route. They decided that they could easily assassinate him and his entourage but only with the permission given by their bishop, Ephthemius Zilo Rodriguez, who was assistant to Bishop Germanos Karabanyevich. The guerrilla sent a monk, Stavros Ioannidis, to Amasia to ask Bishop Ephthemius about their decision to assassinate Kemal Ataturk. The monk's instructions were to definitely get signed statement from Bishop Athenius so that there are no misunderstandings. If his answer were yes, the monk went to Amasia, found Bishop Athenius, and Athenius did say yes. The monk rushed back, and in excitement, he forgot to get the bishop's signature. So he went back to get it. By that time, Bishop Athenius was gone, and the monk 
talk instead to Bishop Caravalletis? His answer was definitely no. Early 1924, after the population exchange, Monk Stavros Ioannidis visited Bishop Caravangelis in Greece. When the two talked about that decision not to attack and kill at a Turk, Bishop Caravangelis seemed devastated, remorseful, and with eyes full of tears, he kept saying, I was wrong, I was so wrong, everything was right, everything was right. Now the story was told to Bishop Ephthemius' brother on November 12, 1953, by Reverend now Stavros Ioannidis, who had since become a priest, at the Church of Agios Nikolos, as a matter of fact, at the cemetery of Agios Nikolos in Drama. The bishop's brother, George Agritelis, left everything in writing, and that is kind of fading now, to his son Christophorus. Back to the first phase of the war. In August of 1920, the Turks and the Allies signed the Treaty of Sèvres in France, on Sèvres, and this treaty had virtually destroyed Turkey as a national state, but it was not ratified though. The second phase from October 1920 to 1921 was characterized by Greek offensive operations. In October of 1920, the Greek army advanced further east into the country with the encouragement of the British Prime Minister David Lloyd George. This advance had started under the government of Alexeios Venizelos, but soon after the offensive began, Venizelos fell from power, most of you know the details, and was replaced by Dimitrios Wunaris, who appointed inexperienced officers to senior commands. The Greeks kept winning for a while, but then the British refused to give the military assistance, while the Turks received significant assistance from the Soviet Union. June 21 to August 22 was the final phase of that war when the Greeks were defeated. After the Turkish victory over the Greeks, the government of Kemal Pasha, let's not forget, the Sultan was in Constantinopoli, and Kemal Ataturk made his Edra in Ankara. So there were two governments at the time for a short period. So the government of Kemal Pasha refused to recognize the Treaty of Sèvres and was in a position now to request a new peace treaty. After lengthy negotiations, a new one was signed in 1923. That was the Treaty of Lausanne, under which a significant provision was the exchange of populations which ended the Greek presence in Asia Minor after 3,000 years. The city of uh, signing the Treaty of Lausanne in Switzerland. Now, I will now mention some names of some people most of us know who were born in Asia Minor. Adamantus Koreis. Elias Venezis, who was born in what is called Aivalik, that was Kidonie, Aiva means Kidoni, Aivalik in Turkish, the city of Kidonia, and that's where he was born. And then he crossed over to Mytilini. Dimitris Psathas in Trapezunda, Pavlos Paleologos, Constantinopoli, Carolos Kuhn, the great theater director, born in Prusa. Vasilis Logothetidis, a Greek actor both on stage and in the movies, born in Miriophito, close to Constantinopoli. Lambros Costandaras, most of us know Costandaras, an actor both on stage and in the movies, born in Constantinopoli. Dimitris Mirat, author, actor, director, born in Smyrna. Manolis Andronikos, the archaeologist who discovered Virginia. He was born in Prusa in 1919 the year that the Turk landed in Amisos. Elias Kazan, Kazanzo, the well-known movie director here in the United States. He was born in Constantinopoli. Aristotelis Onassis, known to so many people around the world, was born in Smyrna in 1906 and so on. And then, Yorgos Sefeis, the distinguished Greek poet, essayist, and diplomat who won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1963. He was born as Georgos Seferiadis. 
The following images give some insight as to the level of Hellenism of the Greeks of Asia Minor. A wedding invitation as it was printed in beautiful Greek in Zmini. An ad for the singer sewing machines in Greek. Now a sample of handwriting in Greek in a housewife's recipe uh, notebook. And look at the calligraphia. And this is my own <coughs> aunt's birth and baptismal certificate issued in Greek in Amasia in 1907. Notice the name of the godmother. If you can see it, it's Orthodoxia. That's her first name. And now, unfortunately, my father's was not saved. It's gone. And now a few things about the music, the dances, and the food the Greeks of Asia Minor carried with them to Greece. The beginning of the 20th century brought in the Rabetico movement, which had local, Smyrnaic, and Byzantine influences. 1923, population exchange. Close to a million and a half refugees went to Greece. They went home. Home, though, is a familiar place, a place with memories, a place with, where ancestors are buried, a place where you're welcome. None of this was true for the prosperous, the refugees. They left a country they loved and a home they loved and went to a place where they were strangers and they were disliked. They lived in towns of parangas, shacks made of whatever cheap material they could find. The once very prosperous Greeks of Asia Minor were stripped of their wealth, went to Greece, and became paupers. The populations of Athens and Thessaloniki doubled. Working and upper middle class Greeks who had lived comfortably in Smyrna and other towns and cities in Asia Minor became the bottom rung in a society that could barely take care of, their, of its own. In the cafes of the back streets of Athens and Thessaloniki, Rebetiko, Greek urban blues, was being played and had a powerful effect on the music and culture of Greece. The lyrics were about the frustration of being poor in a strange land, <coughs> the lost lands, the sadness of the exile as well as the misery of being reduced to less than second class citizens and yes, they were about their desperation and their hopelessness. It was the music of a subculture. The word rebetis is derived from the Turkish word rebet, which means rebellious, unruly, disobedient. Later, as people started restructuring their lives, Rebetico reached general acceptance as the rough edges of its subcultural character were softened and polished. Today, not only it is, very, it is very well accepted, it has become very popular. <coughs> now, Manus Katsidakis summarized the key elements of the Rebetico in three words, Meraki, Kefi, Kaimos, love, joy, and sorrow. As for the musical instruments, we all know the buzuki. Its roots are traced back into antiquity. It evolved from an ancient instrument called pandulidium. And here's a young lady holding one. The word buzuki is derived from the Turkish word bozuk, which means broken, not functioning, halasmeno, because the music sounded weird to Turks. So here's the buzuki and the baklamas. Now baklamas is a similar instrument, but much smaller than buzuki, and the word means to tie, decimal, baklama. And then it's the lyre. Oops, did I go? Okay. Yeah, this is the, the lyre. I'm sorry, I'm at the right place. Lyra of the ancient Greeks, 
and the Byzantine lira. Now, this is at the National Museum of Florence. Here we have the Pontian lira and the Cretan lira. Now, you know the difference between the two. Um, when the Cretans play the lira, they uh, put their foot on a stool and they put the lira on their leg uh, by, the, um, by their knee and they play. Well, the Pondians uh, play standing up in a circle while people dance and they keep playing in the circle. The Cretans play in a different way. And now some of their main dances the Greeks of Asia Minor brought along to Greece, and they were Hasapikos. It was danced by the butchers of Constantinopoli, the Hasapides, or Machelarides, as they were called at the time. Zembetikos, Zembeks, or Zembekides, were originally Turkish irregular soldiers who first fought against the establishment of the Ottoman Empire, but then joined the Kemalist troops and fought against the Greeks. It is believed that this dance was created by Zeynbek warriors. It's not Zembekiko, it's Zeynbekiko. Uh, Zeynbek warriors trying to simulate movements of hawks, you know, with their wings um, open. Tsipteteli. The word means double strength. There are suggestions that the dance already existed in ancient Greeks, known as the Aristophanic dance. Aristophanes was a comic playwright of ancient Athens. Persilamais, it means antichristos, across from each other, and it is danced in couples. There are many antichristo dances, and in some, like in Cappadocia, they use spoons to each hand to add to the rhythm. And now we come to the food. Now, eating food without understanding its origin, it's like eating food without flavor. In the Byzantine era, the cuisine was a merger of Greek and Roman foods, later enriched with spices, sugar, and new vegetables that trade brought from the East. Cooks experimented and created basically two styles in the process. The Asia Minor one, consisting of Byzantine cuisine, always supplemented by trade items, and the leaner style of the Greek main, mainland. The first one was their cuisine. Politike cuisina, mikrasiatiki cuisina. Some of their foods were melitza no salata, tarango salata, briami, we all know those, kopuzakia, pasturma, think about that, suzuki, suzukakia, or pasturmas is wing dried beef that has been made for centuries since at least the Byzantine times. Not, it's not Turkish. There are various stories about the origin of Pasturma. The most common one gives its origins to the city of Kesaria in Cappadocia, where there was a dish called Pastron. And let us not forget that the word keftes, keftes, keftedaki, comes from the Greek word what? Kofton. Cut meat. So when people say, I've heard people say, "Why do you care if that is their Turkey, you know, their uh, Turkish dish?" It's not. It's kofton for kifted dish. Other dishes were made with bulgur, pilafi, dishes with yogurt that includes trechana, which is different than the trechana sweet and sour that we know. Pite, some different than the ones in Greece. Dolmades, dolmadaikas, sweets drenched in syrup, pickled vegetables, turcia. Desserts like Gazandipi, Samali, Kururakia, Kukorapiades from Smyrni, Politikos Halvas from Constantinopoli, Tsurekia, and many, many more. Now, the people from Kondos have the, had their own special cuisine. Some of their foods are Sorbas, Habits, Otia, Kinder, that's Chuknides, some of you might know those, Tanomeno Sorba, Porania, those are beets, Pisia, and many more. Now, I used to be my grandmother's helper during summer when school was out. She made to see out of all sorts of vegetables in big ceramic containers and sweets out of different fruits. I would have my grandmother make mechana, our favorite soup in winter, and my grandmother's specialty, and that was manti. 
Maybe you don't know what menti is. It's an excellent dish for me. And as much as I don't want to brag, my grandmother's menti was the best. <laughs> and it still is. My children and grandchildren absolutely love it. So here are some pictures of the menti I learned to make from my grandmother. The dough ready to make filo out of. Working on the filo. Cutting the filo into squares and putting some cooked ground meat in each square. Making little balls, you see them at the bottom, out of those squares. Arranging them into a tray. The tray now is getting fuller. The whole thing takes about 250 pieces. The tray is full, ready to be baked. The mantis is baked. But there's more to it before it goes to the table. It's cooked with chicken broth, then yogurt with garlic, and other na, and it's really tasty. So, the rest of it for some other time. And thank you again for having me, and thank you for listening to me. <laughs>